the lecture uh, I'm giving tonight is, is, is a bit similar to one I gave last night uh, at MIT, um, where the topic was um, this idea of, of global practice. And, and um, as it was premised by Yang Ho Chang, uh, the chair at MIT, uh, his question was this, uh, by now global practice has already graduated from the initial phase of being a somewhat mysterious and glorified enterprise. Uh, the jet laggers have long become tired, uh, jet setters have long become tired jet laggers. Today global practice seems to be just another approach uh, to survival for many architects and firms. Uh, this new condition deserves a moment of reflection. How has global practice impacted architecture, art, and design? What is the current status of global practice? How may global practice further transform how we work and think? Um, so for us, I think, um, I, I would say we're neither jet laggers uh, or jet setters, but somehow uh, have been responding to opportunities or conditions to build uh, as an emerging and changing field of chances to work in very different uh, building cultures. And perhaps now consistent with our generation is this characterization of practice that is in a sense uh, more nonchalant or able to move around uh, quite uh, quickly, in a sense easily, uh, to conditions, place, uh, specificity uh, as it uh, occurs. Um, and I think um, perhaps um, working in different places and um, because, or contrary to the, this, this myth, I think, of globalization, this uh, idea of sameness everywhere, um, we find uh, differences that are quite interesting uh, in the places uh, and, and, and differences that are quite uh, profound in how it might uh, affect uh, our, our work. Uh, and here I'm thinking very much in terms of technological, uh, economical, material and production differences and how uh, we might take that on. Uh, differences is what has textured our work in the last years is determined by approach and place. At the same time, we feel that there um, is a, a continuous and internal consistency uh, to the work uh, we've been doing. Um, the, um, I would say that the early history of the practice was very much shaped by the events of a newly uh, reunited Germany, particularly the reemerged spaces of the Berlin peripheries. Uh, now we find ourselves working from rather than on a Germany in the context uh, of or, or of, from or on a, a Berlin in the context of a Germany that always has continued, I think, to have a lot to offer. Uh, those first projects focused largely on the landscapes of the periphery and how an architecture could both reside and be generated by those uh, landscapes, be they damaged, fallow, or, or demilitarized sites. Uh, through a series of collaborations with others, and particularly our German-based engineers, these disciplines began to inform these works in a very physical way. We also uh, continue to access digital technologies, which uh, in, a, in, a, in a very distinct sense have really radicalized, I think, uh, the last generation of projects uh, in the office and, and in relationship to this idea of a global uh, context. Um, lastly, uh, in Berlin, we're at the center of an art culture and production that is uh, often closer, I think, to our interests than uh, what the architectural community can sometimes offer. Um, and, it, it, you know, thinking of uh, Olafur Eliasson's uh, exhibition that's coming up next week would be a, a very good example of, of that kind of um, situation. Um, so, so what I'm doing tonight is, is a kind of compressed history uh, with a focus on some of the recent projects. Um, and the focus of the block of the work is twofold. Uh, we're looking at research now in a very um, um, engaged way as an autonomous effort in the practice, something that we did uh, in the schools. Uh, there's much, much more overlap, I think, in terms of the academic projects we are doing and now what we're doing in the office. Uh, it's an office that's dedicated to material, material and prototyping research, which can fold into um, ongoing projects which enables this uh, ambition. Um, and I think, um, you know, a lot of this focus has on, been on engineering and, and digital uh, fabrication, and I really think of it as something that's really uh, trickling down more and more uh, in the work, becoming less and less uh, exclusive. Uh, we're not working, you know, we're not doing Prada boutiques every day, but uh, everyday sort of building types. So this has become quite interesting for us uh, as it well for us. I think when we were students, 
uh, at, the, at the Harvard GSD in the early 90s, I think there was very much a, a, a kind of visceral distrust in, in the digital simply producing images. And we became quickly and very early on uh, interested in how the digital could uh, inform uh, the making of architecture in terms of uh, materials and how that could be taken on, uh, which in this sense I think means that fabrication no longer simply, or this digital fabrication no longer uh, simply accessorizes the architecture, but is uh, contributing to major uh, and significant kind of building components uh, uh, in the projects. And then in the end, I think uh, we're interested in how the research projects uh, can fold uh, into the construction projects uh, that, are, that are continuing and going on. So, um, that was only good, I really wanted to read, but, um, so that in, in this sketch here, uh, which is sort of my, my sort of version of a sort of Saul Steinberg uh, version of how we started in Berlin, where uh, in the beginning it was very much working in Berlin, the peripheries particularly uh, of Berlin, and then a little bit later in southern, sort of industrial south uh, of Germany, uh, uh, we're engaged very much in the, in the kind of European uh, competition uh, process. Um, which gives us the opportunity to look at urbanism, to look at uh, other countries where we can participate in. Uh, at the same time, uh, we continue to uh, use uh, the teaching uh, as a kind of, again, back and forth with the uh, uh, work that's going on in the office. And then more current projects in uh, Asia, Korea, uh, Switzerland, in the States uh, that overlap. So, um, so there is this, this idea of this, this kind of da-da-da-da, of the, the kind of competition work informing the research, informing the build projects. Uh, there's this kind of back and forth of this kind of dialectic or dialogue between these, these, these different um, activities. The, the, the more recent sort of, and I suppose in a, in a way a bit more exotic machine that they're producing now uh, is, is a revolving uh, laser cutting. Um, I like this one a lot because um, you're starting right away with a three-dimensional uh, component uh, rather than sort of cutting pieces um, out of, of, of a sheet metal. And what's also interesting about this is there's a kind of uh, inherent efficiency with this, so where you can cut uh, multiple pieces from one tube and use them. So in a sense, there's no waste uh, from that kind of cutting. You can use all of it. Uh, these tubes are fed into this machine, which then um, uh, are sort of rotating uh, and then being laser cut as that's fed uh, uh, through. Uh, the spaces. Uh, so, so these are uh, examples of two ways of doing this. Uh, some of these shapes are much more um, idiosyncratic, asymmetrical shapes uh, like this, these sort of shard pieces. Uh, others are more sort of uh, mathematically re repetitive. We can take three meter pieces and then graft them together almost like uh, uh, corn husks or something uh, to, to produce these pieces. So uh, there was other exercises of, of, of you know, strength to lightness exercises where we take these pieces and then, and then start to perforate them to get them as, as, as light as possible uh, and then begin to produce you know, larger arrays, uh, more complex. This is you know, like a series of, 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 of several tubes that made this. And then, you know, as, as said, you know, start to fold these into uh, architectural projects. This is an, just an example from a, a loft renovation we did recently where we have um, the, these tubes uh, as a kind of south-facing uh, solar uh, screen wall, um, or um, in, in this film, uh, a, a showroom uh, in, in Sweden, uh, where the, the next sort of operation was to have these tubes uh, rotate. So uh, by rotating them, uh, they could have to do with uh, sunscreening or sun control. Uh, there could be a, a way of sort of revealing uh, things in the showrooms or, or hiding them day, night. Um, so. Um, this, this idea of a kind of kinetic piece. This is a piece uh, we're working on uh, this month for the, the Swiss Architectural Museum in Basel, um, where um, we, we're, we're also working with tubes here from, from highly dense sort of cuts to uh, more sort of elongated, extruded uh, uh, ones. Um, these pieces, uh, the w and the way we do these things is sort of, it's like you, you unfold them. So this is basically a tube fold it out flat so that we can draw it that way and then we can, we can give that to the fabricators and then they put that into their computer and then they can cut these tubes in a, in, in a consistent way. Um, so the three dimensionally that'll uh, produce this kind of array and basically the piece is a, is a kind of uh, light modulator um, that will produce uh, for the space. There's a kind of, let's see if we can't get it to work. There's a, yeah, a little mini film here. 
uh, that shows some of those pin, or oh, how does it do that? Um, that, that produces this, this kind of array of those, those, those different, different pieces. Uh, another sort of, uh, I, I suppose, invention uh, with this uh, is a series of, of uh, by laser cutting those in a, in a scrolled fashion. Uh, the tubes could become uh, uh, flexible, but in, in flexible with a predictable radius that can be variable. You can change it. Um, so that that was a kind of point of, of you know we started that and, you know we produced these kind of this is a piece for uh, Indianapolis in conjunction to a symposium we did in April uh, called manufacturing material effects. Uh, in this case, uh, the tubes are simply uh, lit uh, with LEDs, but um, but we wanted to go further further with this idea. Uh, we're, we're in 2009. We're building a pavilion for uh, the German Architecture Museum. Uh, in uh, Frankfurt, this is the Richard Meyer uh, Museum for Applied Arts. Uh, you might remember along the sort of River K uh, here. So there's our pavilion here, uh, Akuma has a tea uh, pavilion or tea house over here. And then uh, Meyer had built a, a kind of gazebo project uh, over here. So um, the idea with uh, the, the laser cutting was to produce a form that they could use you know, for the 25th year anniversary. Uh, but again, using the cutting to allow for a, a complex and variable uh, radius of these uh, of, of the kind of tube shapes, uh, which we're now you know looking at a one to twenty uh, you know section model uh, of that thing. Uh, we're, we're working closely uh, with one of our German engineers, with uh, Werner Sobeck, uh, who's helping us uh, put this together, and then uh, we'll clad the whole thing with a kind of polka dot uh, skin of of, of macrolone. Uh, uh, over here. So uh, again, this idea of the kind of, you know, detached research work folding into larger uh, in and more uh, complex uh, projects. Yeah, another, another piece we did is this, this kind of X bracing of the facade system. So uh, we produced that, which is a rolled section. And then these are uh, laser cut, which can be either uh, in a sense ornamental uh, or they can be uh, structurally uh, aligned in terms of the kind of depth of these, uh, you know, kind of posts for a, for a facade system with the, you know, the glass, the glazing here, and then this structural profile here. So what's, I, I, you know, which we can quickly use in terms of a project. This is a competition we won a few months ago uh, for a wholesale fashion uh, commercial building uh, in uh, the Killesberg of Stuttgart. It's across the street from uh, or near the, the Weissenhof Siedlung. Uh, basically, formally what the building does is a kind of completion uh, of this abandoned uh, stone quarry, uh, so the building, you know, with the green roof, you know, approximates the level of the, the you know, the top of this quarry here, and then kind of forms or frames uh, this interior space here. But then, very quickly, had a you know a very specific idea of how, uh, through the kind of research work of how that facade uh, might work in terms of uh, kind of sunscreen cladding, uh, you know, entrance uh, over here uh, in terms of a, a, an application. Uh, and then literally, you know, within days, we could start cutting these, these, these sort of spiraling uh, sections for the client and show, you know, him exactly, you know, what we're thinking about that. And then in conjunction uh, with, um, you know, a, a kind of a curtain wall here. And then uh, the, the space is here, very simple, you know, precast concrete uh, uh, building section uh, for it. Um, so, so, so that's all this, this kind of research uh, that we've been working on. Um, I think ultimately... Um, you know, it was, it was about bringing this in in a much, much more sort of um, significant way into the building projects. Uh, this is the gatehouse project we just finished also uh, with uh, engineering from, from Venner Sobeck. Um, and, and this project was going to be very much uh, for the company, you know, uh, you know a real demonstration about uh, the, the, the technology, uh, how they can use that. Um, you know, you know, very muscular, you know, very like, we'll just, we'll cantilever this thing 22 meters and see what happens. Um, you know, just a, a kind of challenge in terms of how that um, uh, could work in terms of the, the engineering of it. Um, you know, of course, you know, we were, we were super aware of a history of this. This is a Jean Privé's uh, 1951 gas station uh, that was bought by uh, Rolf uh, Fellbaum for, for Vitra. Um, but this idea of, 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 of Privé, uh, you know, the architect working out of his factory in Maxiville and, and producing a building out of, uh, of sheet metal, basically, where all those components are operating at multiple scales in the building, the roof, the structure, 
uh, the glazing, the, the furniture, everything. And so, so, so what I did was, you know, how could we, you know, how could we uh, revisit that project in a sense in terms of the technology that we had today? We knew that uh, Trump were producing things like this, these extremely uh, light and stiff uh, kind of um, uh, bulkheads or, or um, uh, plates uh, made out of uh, laser cut and welded uh, steel. Uh, so we've been to, to, to ask the question if, if, if some of this stuff could, uh, in a sense, scale up to the scale of a, of a building. So we were you know, very much you know, looking at uh, this, this cantilevered roof which uh, you know, comes over this columns here, columns here, ventilation here, a, ca uh, a core here and then wrapped by a 20 centimeter uh, double glazed um, curtain wall around here. Um, one of the things you know, that we got you know, from Berner right away was uh, these, these, these diagrams of, of the kind of vector plotting. Um, you know, we were very much interested in making this information somehow uh, coherent or, or legible. And, and also uh, this, this idea of, uh, I suppose, a, a mass customization of, of letting the kind of loading, you know, these being the columns over here where this is in tension here, compression here, and then getting lighter at the end. So that, um, and, and right away we could, in a sense, use the same technology as for bu building the building for building one to 50 models here and beginning to look at a series of, of possibilities for uh, how that, that variation uh, might begin to respond to that kind of uh, structural uh, diagramming. So this is, the, this is the final one. We use triangulation because it's a little bit stiffer. Um, so at the column points, it becomes very, very dense and collective. Uh, at the extent of the cantilever, uh, it becomes very light. You know, we, we were just at Boston looking at Video Diller's uh, ICA, where uh, you know it, it's it's very difficult to understand uh, where those things are. You know, this, this cantilevering roof where the columns, where the supports are. Um, so it was important for us. Uh, not only to, to demonstrate the technology, but somehow make this stuff very physical and very, um, in a sense, under, easy to understand. The plan is very simple. Uh, the four uh, supporting columns here, um, you know, this curtain wall wrapping around here, cars, trucks sort of zipping in and out of this kind of information uh, control point. Um, the, the, the only thing, in a sense, that isn't probably revealed is, is, is the foundation, which is this gigantic 10-ton uh, foundation, which acts as a counterweight. Uh, to that, that, that roof to keep the whole thing from uh, not tipping over. Um, and then, you know, other systems, including the lighting, this is a, a reflected ceiling plan uh, of those coffers up through there, how that could, in a 24-hour cycle, change in terms of uh, color, uh, uh, light. Uh, so we, 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 you know, we build plywood, you know, one to two mock-ups uh, in the studio uh, to, to, to understand uh, sort of the depth is sort of 50, 60 centimeter depth. Uh, of the structure and how that would relate to that. Uh, we built a, an actual one-to-one -one mock up uh, of the piece where you have, again, the, the bottom cord as a kind of lattice uh, changing as well as the, the vertical cords here, which are also getting thinner or thicker, uh, the integration of the, of the gutter here. Um, but this really began the kind of guideline for the, the production uh, of the project, which, you know, at the end of the day, you know, we have, you know, laser cutting, but you have, you know, guys just doing good old fashioned uh, welding, you know, at the, at the side here, uh, um, mechanical fascination, but these fabrication, but these were the, the strips that were being produced and then were brought out, you know, at, at 3 a.m. in the morning uh, on trucks, we'd bring these strips out and then uh, put them out on a series of, of, of um, plates that, that, that support those. These are the, the four columns, stainless columns protected in a, 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 a plywood uh, sheathing and then, uh, and then begin to put the whole assembly together and then took these gurneys and, and then uh, lifted the whole thing up. So, um, and, and I think, you know, th about this time, you know, we're, we, were, we were very much like looking at Mies van der Rohe's, these films, you know, we did for the National Gallery. So we're like sitting in our convertible, you know, smoking cigars and then watching this thing. And then they, they take this gurney away and then there's this kind of sigh of relief where they, they, they pull these things off. The roof kind of bounces about 40 centimeters back and forth and then it kind of settles into place. So that was, uh, a, a great sigh of, of relief that did it. Um, like uh, the National Gallery also, um, the, 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 the roof is extremely uh, complex, so you have a kind of camber in, in both this direction, the long direction, and the sort direction. So what we ended up doing uh, with uh, instructions from Werner was uh, loading the roof with a series of, of, of sandbags, in a sense, to kind of bring the roof uh, in uh, to form. So it was uh, almost 
uh, kind of the reverse of the kind of Frank Lloyd Wright, the famous Johnson wax thing where he loads the Kongs until they break. This one was simply a, a kind of uh, pulling that camber down into a kind of flat level uh, plane. So there's a, a high level of adjustability. Uh, at the end of the day, the project is sort of, um, uh, despite the kind of complexity of the construction, uh, it's in the context of the Stuttgart periphery. Uh, it's like other things around it, the, the gas stations that are out there, the industrial buildings. Um, so it's in that sense also, uh, I think, um, um, familiar, I think, with out within that context uh, as, as well. A at night, uh, the building acts as a kind of lantern. Uh, in the double sandwich uh, curtain wall, there's a series of, 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 of acrylic tubes that are placed in there. Um, the, the underside of the roof becomes a kind of a threshold or a kind of lighting uh, of the entrance uh, through uh, where, where visitors or workers can come through. Um, there was, you know, secondary detail in the project. This is a, a series of telescoping uh, gateways that, that, that produce a kind of, I suppose, you know, filmic uh, moray effect when they open uh, and close. And then the kind of entrance, you know, to this information, you know, small um, kind of reception uh, room here with this roof. Uh, hovering uh, over the top of it. Um, some of the technology is, is not high tech at all. Um, uh, we end up working with uh, craftsmen artists who produce these um, um, acrylic tube walls that uh, we built as kind of uh, rafts that we could set between the glazing um, and then they're kind of pinned to, to each other. Um, these happened uh, you know, in nearby workshops, but uh, in our case, the glass wall is, 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 is completely non uh, load bearing, even the even the columns for the for the curtain wall are are, are plexiglass uh, like the tubes here. So, um, in a sense, it's a completely sort of um, um, as a blur, a kind of ephemeral uh, surface wrapping uh, around uh, the core uh, of the building, which is clad in a white uh, a plexiglass. Um, uh, in order to do this, I, th I think the details become quite important to us. Uh, we have this incredibly uh, dynamic roof uh, in relationship to a very brittle, uh, very rigid uh, facade uh, developed a detail, uh, you know, almost like a shock absorber of this accordion gasket here to let those two systems uh, work uh, independent from uh, each other. So that, you know, that became quite important how to, to do those things. Again, a de detail uh, of the project as this kind of uh, lantern at night. Uh, by daytime, it kind of works in reverse. Uh, where this effect is, is more of an interior one uh, as, as, as that works. 